You will hear a lot of practical insights during this uh, webinar about the state of the industry, but also uh, innovation to watch that could be very useful for your product and market development. Um, just a, a quick reminder, as you might have uh, seen, um, this debate serves as a basis of discussion for the French National Forum on Marine Renewable Energy that is organized by the French Renewable Energy Trade Association, SER, on June 22nd. Um, so you will have complementary information uh, at the forum, uh, but during the next hour, we'll be uh, mainly focusing on market opportunities and also innovation. So what's coming next, um, the webinar will be uh, structured in uh, three different parts. Uh, first, uh, we will welcome Anne Georgelin, uh, manager uh, Marine Renewable Energy and Hydropower at the French Renewable Energy Trade Association, who will uh, share some market insights about the wind offshore market and opportunities in Europe and in France to really demonstrate um, the industry's competitiveness. Uh, we will then welcome uh, Gabriel Castellanos, uh, Associate Program Officer at the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA. We will bring a global perspective and highlight niche market opportunities um, within the MRE sector. And in a third uh, part, we will um, feature innovators uh, we will explain some of the challenges they're facing um, for, the, uh, for the innovation to, to scale up. And we will welcome Patrick Muller, uh, CEO at CoPower, a high efficiency web energy converter, who is also the co-president at Ocean Energy Europe. And we will also welcome Marlene Kierniowski, business developer Ener at Energy de la Lune, and also project coordinator at CINEO. Uh, we will share a transversal view um, uh, uh, thanks to her expertise across many different pilot tests uh, and pilot sites she, she is uh, currently involved in. Um, so to start with, um, I will introduce you to Anne Georgelin. Thank you so much, Anne, for, for being with us today. Uh, we've heard recently in, in the... Um, in a, in a new report from the European Technology and Innovation Platform on Wind that the decarbonization of the economy is not only possible, but affordable. Uh, could wind-based electrification drive Europe to the net zero objective? How competitive will be the French market to, to compare to its European uh, neighbors? What is, uh, what is your, your point of view on this? Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me in this uh, webinar today. So I'll try to share my presentation um, just to give you some information. So just to give everyone some insights about Anne's uh, background. So and is uh, specialized on offshore winds uh, and marine renewable energy and hydropower. Uh, and she was in charge for many years at the French embassy in Madagascar and also worked for various renewable energy projects in France, but not only. Thank you. And uh, over to you. Thank you. I think it's working right now. So yes, just to introduce this webinar, I was as to give you an overview of the marine renewable energy market, both in Europe and in France. And to answer very quickly your question, uh, sure, marine renewable energy will have a key role to play to achieve net zero uh, in Europe, in France and in the world. So I'll give you some insight about it. And just a quick word about the French Renewable Energy Association um, at the beginning. Uh, it's a trade association created in 1993 uh, to gather uh, all players in the renewable energy sector uh, working in France and having interest in the French market. And we have a very classical uh, role to play, meaning gathering professionals from these sectors, representing and defending their interest. Um, today, we gather about 400 members, among them 100 
roughly are active in the marine renewable energy sector. And so we try to make them work together and then represent them um, to the public administration, for instance. Um, so I'll start classically with an overview of marine renewable energy in the world, then in Europe, then in France, and we'll talk lastly about the perspective. So among marine renewable energy, offshore wind is by now the most developed, uh, with a global capacity about 30 gigawatt. Those figures of 20 gigawatt uh, were from the end of 2019. And uh, so we must be above 30 gigawatt right now. Um, in comparison with the global power capacity, it's quite low. It's not very significant. It's just a reflect that it's a new technology, but a new technology growing fast and with a huge potential. When I mean growing fast is that during the last decade and then less, um, many gigawatts have been um, launched and put in service uh, in Europe and in Asia as well. And the second key point that we have uh, on those figures, meaning that Europe was historic historically the first place for offshore wind development, but Asia and especially in China, the market is really growing fast those last years, and it's a key trend uh, for the coming years. Regarding the European level, we are still the first and major place for offshore wind development. Uh, with a global capacity of uh, 24 gigawatts, so among uh, 30 in the world, so it's roughly the two, two thirds of it, and meaning that there are over 5,000 turbines connected to the grid and produce, producing uh, probably right now, uh, with the first turbine being installed in 1991 in off Denmark, so over 30 years ago. And these turbines have already been dismantled. Uh, so it gives us it gives you an idea of the experiment that we have in Europe regarding uh, offshore wind. The United Kingdom, uh, Germany, Denmark, Belgium, and the Netherlands are definitely the key and major market in Europe for offshore wind so far. But France is growing, and that's what I wanted to tell you then: that the French market uh, is relatively late. Uh, in comparison to our neighbor for offshore wind. Uh, as I said, uh, 5,000 turbines are right now connected to the grid and we have none in France, despite our great potential and a strong coast linear wind potential, we have everything to succeed in offshore wind. So why are we so late? Um, well, for different reasons, but the good news is uh, that we have seven uh, major offshore wind project launched and ongoing. Uh, for every, every project is a capacity of about 500 um, megawatt. So it's quite significant. And among the seven projects, uh, four of them are under construction. So it's very concrete. If you go to uh, Le Havre or Saint-Nazaire in the Atlantic coast, you'll see what happened. And you'll see that those projects are being um, under construction work right now. Uh, two of them are in Normandy, one of them is in Brittany, and the last one is in Saint-Nazaire, so in the Atlantic uh, area, and they should be the first one uh, to be uh, operational in 2022, so it's coming quite soon. Um, those projects in France are bottom fixed projects for offshore wind, and we also have some floating offshore wind technology under development, with four pilot farms uh, being right now permitted and that should be uh, constructed between 2022 and 2023, so quite soon as well. Um, we have to admit that for floating offshore wind, we are not so late as we are for bottom fix of offshore wind in France, uh, because in Europe and in the world right now, um, there is um, a dozen of pilot projects um, being developed and having four of them in France is quite a success. Um, so we can hope that we will be well positioned on this technology in the coming years. And um, also because we have one of the great potential in Europe for floating offshore wind and in us to enabling us to uh, harness offshore wind potential in the Mediterranean Sea, for instance, 
what the what of this is too important uh, to have bottom fixed offshore wind. Um, finally, ocean energy. Um, well, regarding the global market, and as the other panelists will uh, precise, uh, we are not yet at the co at a commercial stage for ocean energy, but it's in under preparation. And reflecting that in France, we have quite demonstration project that has been launched and operated those last years. Um, in the picture on the left, you have a picture of Sabella and Sabella's turbine, who, which was uh, installed in the Fromber, so very west part of France, and uh, which has been working for a few uh, months and enabling, enabling some um, upgrades in the technology. Uh, in the middle picture, you have the hydro request um, picture of the turbine installed in Pampolbrea, so north of uh, Brittany. And uh, this turbine has been working for more than one year and uh, has led to a certification, certification of the power curves of the technology and an upgrade to a new technology as well for tidal energy. And on the right, you have a wave gen uh, picture. So it's a wave energy um, technology installed in Le Croisic, so west part of France as well, close to Nantes. And this um, technology has been installed last year as well uh, for demonstration um, for the future. Regarding industrial development, um, what is interesting with marine renewable energy is that those projects are very often linked to industry and industrial development for the territories of the coast, but also national territories. And it's quite a good story to tell about the French market that although we are quite late for offshore wind commercial development by now, we still have quite a good story about industry hosting three major industrial uh, sites in France to produce uh, offshore wind turbines. And we have, for instance, one turbine assembly factory in Saint-Nazaire, one blades factory in Cherbourg, and one blades and turbines factory under construction in Le Havre, and that's a picture you have. And to give you an idea, those kind of industrial um, implementation only exists by a dozen in Europe, so it's quite a rare factory, and we have some of them in France. Mm, I don't want you to think that offshore wind and marine renewable energy industrial activity is only related to big and major industry sites. Uh, it's also uh, very numerous um, activities uh, that are related to those uh, projects uh, in logistics, in marine facility, um, in the supply chain. So broad range of opportunity uh, to participate in those projects and in jobs creation. Uh, for now, the, well, the industry and the sector represent about 5,000 jobs. So it's a uh, growing, and we accept this number. We sorry, uh, we expect this number to grow even more in the coming years with the construction phase, and that's something we can quite easily see in uh, Le Havre where foundations are being built for the Fécance project, for instance, in Brest as well, um, far west of, uh, of France, uh, on the harbor, where a lot of construction work is ongoing, and also in Saint-Nazaire, uh, where, for instance, uh, offshore wind substations are being built. And finally, what about perspective? I told you, but I think it's uh, the key word right now, both for offshore wind and marine energy, uh, the market is growing, is growing and growing and growing for the 10, 20, 30 years to come. Uh, it's a very rich market for opportunities, both in France, in Europe and in the world. And every report you can read, although they may have some different perspective, uh, all converge on one point. The market is growing and sharply growing um, just because um, marine energy is a very good solution. Uh, to bring us a clean, renewable, and competitive technology to supply our need in electricity, but also in heat or in uh, air conditioning, for instance. And um, when you read the Green Deal uh, and the offshore, offshore strategy published by the European Commission in uh, last uh, October, it's very interesting because you see 
that the European Commission has set some targets and ambitious targets for marine energy and offshore wind in Europe by 2050, because those uh, energy are really key to achieve our net zero emission target. And to say it in another way, it's very hard, uh, not to say impossible, to achieve this goal without sharply developing those technology in Europe and in France as well, because we have one of the greatest potential for offshore wind and marine renewable energy in Europe. To put it in figure, uh, this offshore, off, offshore wind strategy um, says in Europe that we are right now at 12 gigawatt of installed capacity for offshore wind by 2020. And our target is 300 gigawatt by 2050. So a very, very strong increase. And it's the same for marine renewable energy in this strategy. We are about uh, a dozen of um, megawatt installed by 2020 for tidal on wave, uh, wave technology. And uh, the strategy set the objective of 40 gigawatt working by 2050. So it's also a very strong increase uh, to be organized. This is for Europe, but, uh, and I think uh, the other panelists will also show it, it's the same train that can be observed all over the world uh, because we have competitive technology uh, based on the experiments that we gained in Europe those last years. And we also have, um, well, some very useful um, characteristic of um, marine energy and offshore wind uh, so that we, those technology can have a, a strong and interesting place in our net zero future mix for power production. That's for last one for France. So we are right now about a zero megawatt installed for offshore wind and marine energy. We should be by 2024 about three to four gigawatt installed. And our target is about 50 gigawatt by 2050. So also a very sharp increase to come and uh, to organize. And it's, it's related to uh, many challenges, um, planification and spatial planning. Um, competitiveness, surely, and um, also organizing the installation of those uh, technology in regard with other activities located in the ocean, uh, such as uh, fishery or marine traffic and so on. So what we have in France for now, to speak clearly about the future market, is that we have five tenders organized by the state between 2020 and 2023. Uh, so those standards will be launched or have been launched uh, in the very coming um, months. Unfortunately, it's only uh, concerning uh, offshore wind and uh, not uh, ocean energy, for which we're still a waiting perspective from the state. And we deeply hope that the demonstration project that we have in France and in Europe uh, will eventually convince the French authority uh, to give and establish a trajectory for those technology in France um, to organize commercial deployment in consistency with the European trajectory uh, set up at 40 gigawatt by 2050. So I hope it was clear and I'm open for discussion and also complement with the other panelists. Thank you so much, Anne, for, for this very detailed presentation that gives us uh, a lot of insights uh, about the state of, of the market, but also the, the opportunity and uh, the, the opportunities in a, a positive outlook as well. Uh, despite France being late, there are many uh, opportunities there, and that should, it should not be uh, forgotten. Um, with a, a, total, a total worldwide offshore wind power capacity that, that is a uh, is increasing. Uh, I would like to introduce you to Gabriel Castellanos, the Associate Program Officer at IRENA, uh, who is going to bring us a global perspective and highlight some um, additional niche market opportunities for the MRE uh, sector. Uh, so Gabriel, uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, so you have been uh, working in the energy environment sector uh, for many years in Latin America and the Caribbean, but also in Africa, Asia, and Europe. So very wide 
global experience uh, and you work on many different energy planning policies uh, and analyze uh, an analysis of the climate agenda. And uh, you work as well with uh, government and regional bodies in the development of national um, and regional uh, projects uh, and energy plans. Um, so Gabrielle, tell us a bit more, like what are the current opportunities for the marine renewable energy industry? Thank you. Thank you very much Lupe, for, for the invitation and for the opportunity to be here today with, with you all. Um, so following with your, with your question, I'll present a number of slides where I'll address precisely those, uh, those matters. Um, first of all, uh, worth uh, well, presenting to you about IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency. We are an intergovernmental organization. We have 164 member countries, 20 in accession. Our headquarters are in Abu Dhabi, in the UAE. We have our Innovation and Technology Center here in Bonn, where I'm placed, and uh, also a permanent observer to the United Nations in the US. So with that brief introduction about uh, our agency, I'll jump into the question. So I think that's something very important about uh, offshore renewables, marine uh, energy, is the different synergies that that can create in the language of uh, how to foster a blue economy, powering islands and developing states, protecting coastal communities and decarbonizing the, the power system and the energy, the, the whole of the energy system. Um, there are a number of synergies, as I mentioned, in terms of uh, aquaculture, with the oil and gas sector as well, in how to decarbonize hard private sectors, such as the shipping sector, well, the desalination and cooling now continue developing on this. So regarding the, the status and outlook for offshore renewables in terms of offshore wind, ocean energy and floating PV, it's very interesting if we analyze the market status right now and what the market will look like in 2030, 2050. So, in terms of what is coming in the in the next decade and towards 2050, Irina uh, works uh, through the uh, world transition, world energy transition outlook, where we develop a number of scenarios and analyze different uh, energy plans from the from from all over the world. And what we are seeing is that right now, for instance, in terms of uh, offshore wind. We have, as of 2020, 34 gigawatts of installed capacity. Uh, this represents a growth of 18% between 2019 and 2020. The leading region is, uh, is Europe, as we saw in the previous presentation, with 90% of the global capacity. But new market uh, is China, it's emerging. Uh, by in 2020 alone, it was responsible for three gigawatts, China. And then over 2030 and 2050, what we will see is that if we are to achieve or uh, to limit global warming by 1.5, uh, this will represent that global capacity will be of around 318, 2030 and 2000 in 2050 uh, with floating being around 30 gigawatts in 2030 and 300 in 2050. Now, in terms of the competitiveness, it's very important if we look at the fixed foundations, what we saw in 2019 in terms of the options was that fixed foundations came at a cost of 11 uh, US per kilowatt hour, but uh, the options in uh, the next two years we are seeing already prices of 5 cents and 10 cents per kilowatt hour, some important uh, improvement or in terms of competitiveness and similar trend in floating, in floating foundations. So certainly very, very promising the, the global offshore wind market in, towards 2030 and 2050. In terms of, of ocean energy, the let's say tidal and wave 
another but especially tidal and wave is still small we saw that the, in 2020 global capacity was around 535 but towards 2030 2050 it is expecting expected to grow to 70 and 350 gigawatts respectively and again in terms of competitiveness we are seeing our analysis show that there's going to be an important improvement in tidal we see now big ranges between 20 to 45 us per kilowatt hour wave 30 to 55 right towards 2030 we could easily see costs of around 11 us per kilowatt hour so it's very 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 promising a floating pv is also emerging and growing rapidly while current uh, installed capacity is a small 2.5 gigawatts uh, we will see that asian countries will drive future demand including India, Korea, they already have concrete plans for, for installing uh, floating PV. Uh, the competitiveness in 2020 was shown to be 35 US per kilowatt hour. We are still trying to understand how these, uh, its competitiveness will look like in the years to come. It's uh, still, let's say we have seen like very, very few installations yet, promising still. Uh, some recent developments to, to point out. In China, we saw an important deployment of 150 megawatts. In Ghana as well, five megawatts. In the Netherlands, in Singapore, 27 and 50 megawatts. So definitely a growing market. If we are to deep dive into some niche markets, I think that we cannot leave uh, outside small island developing states and what islands have to offer. As I mentioned at the beginning, there are a lot of synergies between marine renewable energy and end use sectors or certain needs that are very particular to, to islands and to their context, being the need for cooling, the need for desalination, so the need for fresh water, uh, offshore oil and gas that is placed around some some seeds, not all but some aquaculture and and, and shipping. Um, in terms of innovative trends, what we are seeing, if we are to talk about fixed offshore wind, and before I jump into seeds, the trend that we are seeing is like, of course, like larger turbines and deeper waters that we saw in the previous presentation. The, the, the harnessing uh, offshore energies, marine energies for generation of green hydrogen, there is a big, big trend, uh, especially offshore wind, floating, funda floating foundations, the development of artificial islands and the urban wind energy systems. Still, there are some work that needs to be done there in terms of research and development, but it's taking off. Um, in terms of uh, some applications, industrial and local consumption, I mentioned some uh, end use needs, but the trend that we are seeing is a high interest on uh, the deployment of offshore renewables, marine, tidal and wave, OTEC as well in a small island developing states, for instance. And, and the reason and the opportunities why small island developing states are uh, attractive niche market is because many small island developing states still rely heavily on, um, on fossil fuels, diesel and heavy fuel oil for power generation, which leaves them um, exposed to the fluctuation of the oil prices. And sometimes they see, depending the period, they, they tend to see some very high costs on electricity generation. So marine energy can, is, could, could be competitive there. If we look at the tariffs that, for instance, the residential sector is, is, um, has been exposed to, in some cases, up to 40, 50 US per kilowatt hour. And then, of course, the vulnerability of our seats to climate change and how uh, some marine technologies could help us as buyers there. Um, 
another like to, to develop further in why seats are niche markets well they as i pointed out in the previous slide they is, is evident that they do require to diversify their supply um, small island developing states have very limited uh, land availability so looking at their so at their that they are surrounded by by sea by ocean which is <laughs> obvious and very evident but it's important that the deployment, for instance, of renewables on the on onshore, like so on land, could uh, be an issue. So it's quite attractive then harnessing the space that uh, we have there in the ocean. There are some case studies already, and of course the need for electricity, desalination, cooling. So those are the important um, synergies that could be created. An example and uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, technology is absolutely OTEC, um, where we could like uh, uh, support to satisfy their needs for desalination, for cold water, so cooling. And uh, an analysis that we did in the Caribbean in a number of islands, let's say Antigua, Barbuda, Bahamas, Barbados, Grenada, Jamaica, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, among others show that the OTEC potential is around 1,000 megawatts, which uh, for in Europe might look very small since we talk about gigawatts scales, but absolutely for, for seeds that have uh, between 50 megawatts in total installed capacity to 200 megawatts of total installed capacity, having a, a overall potential of 1,000 is certainly quite promising. There are a number of things, of course, that need to be done if we are to unlock the ocean energy potential in terms of, of technology, policy, environmental and social and infrastructure. It is very important to, to work towards the standardization, technology coverage and uh, standardization, as I mentioned, conduct resource assessment campaigns. We still do not understand fully in many parts of the world what is their final overall potential for the different uh, uh, ocean energy technologies. Uh, it is required to, to invest efforts on test centers and cap capital grant funded for research and development would be very important in terms of that policy. Uh, the three, four policies that we think are important to, to push forward are premium price for megawatt hour for ocean energy, promote innovative business models, and compensate additional services that are provided by, by ocean energy beyond the power generation, let's say. So uh, cooling and other benefits around aquaculture, for instance. So capitalize those as well. And, uh, and well, in terms of, of infrastructure, to be aware of the synergies with our renewable energy technologies and how ocean energy can provide firm capacity, something that is very, very relevant in a small and developing states and that cannot be provided, but by variable renewable energy sources. And certainly it's very important to, to work on developing the supply chains there. So with, with that last slide, just uh, want to take this space to make you a kind of invitation to everybody to join our uh, collaborative framework for ocean energy and offshore renewables, where we facilitate government peer-to-peer -peer collaboration and exchange of knowledge. We have 40 member countries engaged and involved plus industry associations on this. So an invitation to, to everybody. So I'll pass the floor back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gabrielle, for, for this presentation and uh, highlighting some of the important development in, uh, in the small island developing states. Uh, ahead uh, of this webinar, you mentioned to me uh, a lot of uh, European projects are actually involved in uh, an investment as well, are involved in those small islands. Uh, and there are many different opportunities and, and possible uh, partnership to, to, be, um, to be developed. So thank you so much. Um, during the, this preparation as well, Anne mentioned a very interesting figure that uh, some of us might, might already know, but I would like to share with you, and that will bring a, a question as well to Anne. Um, so this figure is that one um, wind farm could provide of 500 megawatts could actually provide energy for 700,000 inhabitants. 
So that's actually, you know, a real opportunity for the, the small islands, but also uh, for some of the um, French uh, regions. So, and do you observe any uh, maybe upgrades uh, projects that are currently in development in France or any niche opportunities that you would like to highlight or share with us today? Sure, how to say it, marine energy and offshore wind are a solution for the national grid that we know, but also for ancillary uh, territories, as uh, the Irina presented. And because on those uh, territories, uh, we also have some, well, great potential and a high cost of electricity. And in France, for instance, we have created an interesting project, which is called the FAR project, uh, concerning the Russian Islands. So, very far west of France. Uh, it's an island quite to the, close to the Brittany region, but not connected to um, the national French grid. Uh, so independent uh, territory. And they are developing a project, uh, very interesting because they are combining different sources of renewable energy, uh, meaning two, uh, well, tidal energy using tidal uh, current, uh, one wind turbine using the wind, which is very strong on this island, and uh, solar energy and a battery uh, solution, and combining those uh, three different renewable energy technology, uh, they can replace uh, almost a two thirds of the production of the fuel um, technology that we had before, which was very costly and uh, very polluting as well. So this is an ongoing project, but it will be very in interesting an example on how renewable energy technology uh, can be combined uh, to offer solution to uh, insulated uh, territories. Thank you, Anne, for, um, for sharing uh, some insight, which brings us to open a question to the, to the audience. Uh, so you will have a question coming up uh, on screen that we invite you to answer. Uh, According to you, uh, what source of ocean energy do you think has the most potential? So we're going to wait a few minutes for you to fill in. Um, so tell us what you think. Might be wave, might be tidal, uh, maybe wind, maybe OTAC, as Gabrielle mentioned, uh, maybe solar and floating solar. Um, tell us what, what you think has the most potential. Gonna wait till it's a bit longer. It's moving a little bit. Go on, make a choice. All right, so uh, we're going to close the call. So it seems according to the audience that wind has um, the most potential at 59% uh, of the audience think so. Uh, and wave as well with uh, around 21, 22% of the audience. Um, so that brings us to, to the next section uh, of the webinar uh, with some of the solution that we will be highlighting uh, and also the challenges that uh, our innovators today uh, are facing. Uh, so let me introduce you to uh, Patrick Muller, uh, the CEO of CoPower, who is also the co-president of Ocean Energy Europe. Uh, he is a seasoned entrepreneur and technologist uh, with experience of running technology startups uh, with complex product development. He also co-founded CoPower in uh, 2012 and has now taken the companies through three stages of structured product verification. Um, so Patrick, uh, it's over, over to you. Thanks a lot uh, for that introduction. Great to be here. So I'll give you an update uh, of what we're doing in wave energy. So Copar, we are one of the developers working hard to bring reliable and competitive technology to allow us to extract clean energy from our oceans. Uh, brief introduction about uh, core power. Uh, so we are a developer of the technology. We're an OEM, so we're offering wave energy converters and 
operations and maintenance services to our customers are typically then utilities and the oil and gas companies could also be local communities and islands and so owning and operating the uh, wave farms. So we started in 2010, we get offices today in Sweden, Portugal, Norway and Scotland. And um, we're seeing quite a lot of uh, new engagement from big players in the sector. I'll, I'll give you an update of where wave energy lies today and some of the opportunities, but also discussing some of the challenges that we have. Um, so we are a, mainly a Sweden and Portugal based company today, but almost a quarter of, of a core bar is French, I would say. We have a small uh, Polytechnic and Superlec club here in Stockholm as well. So it, it, we're quite pan European, I would say. In, in, the kind of people. We're a bit more than 55 people in our team, so I think the biggest team in uh, wave energy. Uh, the opportunity we're after to enable it to make wave energy competitive and reliable, of course, which is a huge opportunity. It's the largest untapped source of clean energy that the world has there. Around 500 gigawatts of potential, somewhere around the same magnitude as all the nuclear capacity or all the hydro capacity of the world today. So it's huge. And the Atlantic coast of Europe is an amazing resource. Uh, France, Portugal, uh, the UK, uh, and, and Ireland, and Norway has an amazing resource here for, for Europe. But what's interesting about it, in addition to being a large and a clean source of energy, it is the very consistent and complementary production profile that matches very well with high penetrations of wind and solar. And wave energy can help to bring balanced 100% renewable electricity systems. If we look at a typical week, this example is from California 2018 data week in October, you see the variability of PV, yellow, light blue being wind and dark blue being simulated as if we had six gigawatts along the Californian coast. And consistently you see wave energy being a much more flat and consistent curve, meaning that Wave energy offers a source that is much closer to base load that you can use to fill out the gaps, essentially when it's not windy and not sunny, and where the combination of the three can reach very high levels of penetration without the need for large amounts of uh, storage, for large amounts of overcapacity, and large amounts of um, new capacity in the grids. So that enables the transition to 100% renewables with an overall less costly energy system. And that's really one of the big opportunities with uh, wave energy. Uh, the challenge though, is to design devices which are robust enough to survive the toughest storms at the same time, make it a viable business case. And historically wave energy devices have often broken in storms or they've just not produced enough to make it a, a viable case compared to the size and the cost. And that's a picture that we have dramatically changed. We have introduced a new type of high efficiency wave energy converters. This is our recent C3 machine, which was a half scale device, 4.2 meter diameter, 25 kilowatt rating that we tested between 2015 and 18, together with Iberdrola and other partners in the Orkney Islands at the EMEC test center. So we've introduced a number of solutions that make wave energy uh, better. The first one is survivability. So our devices are designed to be naturally protected and transparent to ocean waves. So here you're seeing the device operating in a 50 knot storm in the Orkney Islands, individual waves of four meters. So corresponding to eight meter waves in full scale sweeping by. And you can see how the boy is just sitting there. It's not moving up and down. It's not moving to the side. It's just letting the waves sweep by. So we have introduced to wave energy, the equivalent of pitching the blades in a wind turbine, which every wind turbine has to survive storms. And that's a solution that has previously been missing in wave energy. Uh, this, on, this is great for survivability, makes it a useless wave energy converter because it doesn't react to waves. So what we do in regular ocean conditions is that we adv use advanced control technology that puts the device in optimal timing with each incoming wave that strongly amplifies the motion and thereby the power capture. So with that, we can absorb and convert a large amount of energy using a small low cost uh, device. So when you combine those things together, it brings a very competitive uh, path for wave energy. It becomes survivable by being transparent in the normal state. And then we get about five times as much energy per amount of equipment that you need to install in the ocean compared to what has been historically possible with wave energy. And that brings a very competitive uh, cost of uh, electricity 
So combining that with the grid balancing and, and the value to the energy system, wave energy can play a big role uh, when we bring this uh, forward. Uh, the product we're developing is a race of 10 to 30 megawatts, where we are developing the wave energy converters themselves, the anchoring technology, the electrical connectivity network, um, and there to bring it up to a common grid connection point that can also be combined with offshore wind. Several of the projects and the customers we're working with today are developing floating wind farms, and they're looking to combine arrays of our wave devices together with floating wind in order to get the benefit from a more consistent flat production profile to sell a more valuable electricity and then using the same export cable to re reduce the cost of that. There's a very interesting opportunity there by combining floating wind and wave coming along the market. We've been demonstrating this technology in a structured five-stage approach, which is today the recommended me method to bring ocean energy to market. So we've been going through a lot of stages of small scale prototype testing in wave tanks, in bench prototype testing in, in, in on land rigs and benches. And then in stage three, we took a half scale device through ocean demonstration that I showed before. We're currently in stage four doing our first commercial scale equipment. So this is currently being built in Stockholm, being dry tested and gonna be installed in Portugal towards the very end of this year. We're then adding three more uh, commercial scale devices into an array demonstration in stage five. And by clocking enough data on that, we will achieve type certification and bring this to bankable product offering by 2024. So we're ready to start shipping uh, devices in volume to customers from 2024 and onward. So you had some comments on the previous presentations about wave energy is not really there yet in commercial projects, but it's really getting close now. It's happening. And we have several developers developing projects based on, on that timeline now around Europe. So the demonstration we're doing here in stage four and five, we're doing in Agusadora in Northern Portugal in collaboration with EDP and Wavec. So we're first installing a C4 device, the single device, and then three more devices into this demo array. Uh, this is the same site that Principal Power and EDP brought the wind flow technology uh, to market at. And uh, in Sweden, we are doing the build of the devices, uh, the inside of them. So we have our assembly halls where our device looks like this in, in full scale. And we also have installed the world's largest dry test rig to be able to uh, debug, stabilize, and fully test our devices up to full range storm loading. We can try devices here uh, representing the wave loading of any site around the world in dry testing before we bring it into the ocean. And that's a strategy we do to make sure that we have reliable equipment once it gets installed in the ocean. And in Portugal, we have developed a very interesting uh, method for mobile factories of the hull itself. We use a composite hull that we fabricate with filament winding. And we have now a fabrication line in Viana de Costello in northern Portugal, in the port where we are demonstrating how to fabricate our composite hulls using a mobile factory concept. So in the future, instead of shipping many hundreds and thousands of hulls around the world, we will move the machines from site to site and do local fabrication, which also brings a lot of local content into the uh, value uh, chain there, which is very interesting for the various regions we, we're going into. So ocean energy with a more, if you say modular approach compared to wind, offers really revitalizing a lot of the port infrastructure, a lot of the local uh, infrastructure and, and, and supply chain. And we're doing that development in Portugal at the moment, and we're hoping to get into France and many other places of Europe soon and do that same developments. Um, also, these devices are fairly uh, small and lightweight. Uh, the full scale devices are about nine meters in diameter and 65 tons, which compared to wind turbine is very, very small. And that allows you to use local vessels, local crews, and have a very low, uh, high content there of, of local uh, economic activity, which makes it uh, yeah, quite different to floating wind, uh, let's say, in, in, in that sense. So ocean energy now speaking as a representative of Ocean Energy Europe, it's a huge industrial opportunity here for Europe. We're talking about 100 gigawatt of targets to 2050, so about a third of what we heard from the, the wind capacity or the offshore wind capacity mentioned before. Uh, opportunity to create 400,000 jobs in this uh, period of time. 
and we have a true global leadership in Europe in ocean energy at the moment. And this is something we should keep investing in to keep that leadership and really get the jobs and the industrial development happening here in Europe. Uh, what we need in wave energy is to have revenue support in the various countries to do the very first commercial project. When we started with small 5, 10, then moving to 50 to 100 giga megawatt farms, the early days before we get to some volumes, we need some revenue support so that our customers can make a profitable uh, projects. And we're talking about 600 megawatts of the first installations uh, before we are reaching about a 65 euro per megawatt hour uh, LCOE. And at that point, we can be competitive fully with uh, wind and solar considering the great value of selling electricity when it's most needed in the energy systems. And then we have a clear path to scale that down to 30, 40 euro per megawatt hour level. So becoming fully competitive on our own with not so huge uh, installed base in the end. So a fantastic industrial opportunity for Europe, we would say. Thanks. Thank you, Patrick, uh, for, for those insights. And as you heard, it's really an untapped source of energy with a lot of potential and very interesting mix as well with um, the development of uh, mixed energy farms. Um, so if there are any investors, you know, in the, in the audience today, uh, you heard Patrick uh, cool. Uh, we need investment, we need capital. Um, and uh, actually, um, Patrick, one, one question for you. Uh, what do you think uh, the European Green Deal has brought into the table for, for innovators to, to support innovation? Uh, there's fantastic opportunities. We're hoping to see the announcement of the first rounds of the Green Deal calls coming later this year. And we're hoping to see here from the sector several projects in ocean energy getting some extra push on that one. And it's interesting also, I see that people are asking to see this integration of the energy systems more and more. I mean, a big role for ocean energy is to allow a high total penetration of renewables, to allow 100% renewable system. And a lot of the challenge that the world has now in front of us is not the total amount of energy, it's to make sure that we have renewable energy at each hour of the year. And that's where the combination of floating wind, floating PV, wave tidal, and so on becomes extremely interesting. And the Green Deal also calls for some of these combined demonstrators, which is interesting to see. Thanks, Patrick. Um... What is some, some interesting insight as well we, we gathered from, from our audience ahead of, uh, of this webinar. We ask the question, what are, according to them, the main obstacles to, to, to the development of the marine renewable energy sector? Um, and you will see on screen uh, very shortly uh, the uh, statistic. So we have some top five. Uh, some of this obstacle are social and environmental acceptability public authorities' engagement and political issues, the fishing industry, the cost of dismantling and recycling, and regulation seems to be the main obstacles today to the development of MRE. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, a, a question to all panelists. Uh, if uh, one of you or several of you would like to answer, it seems like straight to the presentation that we've just seen, Web Energy has a most potential in the energy mix. What do you think is, is actually missing for wave energy today to, to deploy massively? Who, who would like to, to take this question? I'm happy to comment if nobody else wants to. Okay, um, go ahead, Patrick. I'm deeply involved, but, no, but I, would, I would say right now, Wave energy has moved away from an R&D stage to a stage where the industrial deployment is the big opportunity and the big challenge. And really what we need now, the biggest challenge, I guess, is to take us through the stages of the first pre-commercial and commercial projects developed on commercial grounds uh, so that the, the technology gets fully proven and the, the sense of risk is strongly reduced on that one. And for that, we need... Uh, revenue support from countries, uh, the ones along the Atlantic coast in Europe primarily, and some grant support from Europe uh, to allow the customers, the utilities and oil and gas companies to 
take the risk, if you say, to build the early arrays to get the volumes uh, to, to happen. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so we're running a little bit out of time, but I invite you to stay uh, 10 minutes longer. We have one more panelist uh, here who will share very interesting insights about her transversal uh, view on the Omni sector. So let me introduce you to uh, Mahan Kinovsky, a business developer at Energy de la Lune and also a project coordinator at CNEO. She's an expert in ocean sciences and work with French authorities and, and territories. She's also um, running a hydropower pilot test uh, here in France. Uh, so Marlene, uh, over to you to share some of the insights uh, that you have on some of the uh, projects that you're involved in. Thank you very much. I'll try to be as inspiring as, as Patrick, <laughs> who did a brilliant presentation. Maybe just to comment on the pool you just closed, um, I'd like to raise the issue that, uh, on, in my opinion, uh, social acceptance is not the main challenge for ocean, tide, ocean tidal and wave technology. It's, it's, of course, a big challenge for wind energy, but other ocean energy projects benefit from a very high social acceptance, and this is really a key issue for, for, for the sector. So if you can please go further on my slide, I'll just uh, give you a quick insight on, uh, on who, who we are. So um, my name is Marlene Kiersnowski. I'm working for Energy de la Lune, as you, as you said. Energy de la Lune is an engineering firm that do mostly um, site characterization, site assessment for marine energy projects. We do also some consultancy around marine energy projects. And we've, uh, we've set up a tidal test site located in, in Bordeaux back in 2015. Uh, this is a small scale test site. And more recently, we've uh, entered into collaboration with the uh, French utility EDF in Northern Bretagne, where we run a second test site for ocean scale technologies in Pampolbria. And we are an active member of the different uh, associations that are also in, in, in the panel. So, so thanks, uh, thanks for, for them to, to be here. I think their insight and, and role in the sector development is, is really key. The next slide just show quickly uh, because usually we, we are understood to be a company in tidal energy, which is true, but we're also having activity on many other marine renewable energies. So today I'll, I'll give you some information about uh, the Tiger project uh, for many reasons. Uh, the first one is that this is one of the biggest projects ever approved by an interact program. It's more than 45 million euros. It, was, it will last four years and it gather uh, many different stakeholders, uh, the, the main turbine manufacturers in, in, in the UK and France, um, important universities, uh, part of the supply chain. And why, why did we do that project at first? Because, uh, because it's across the channel, which is a an important area for uh, tidal energy, as we will see uh, later on. And also uh, because for us, the main challenge, and this has been said before, is to drive the cost down. The technologies are really ready for commercial. We've succeeded in, uh, in a number of demonstration projects, and now it, it's really time to go to, to, to the market. We've identified quite well, I, th I think, the past four uh, cost reductions, and now it's time to, uh, to, to make uh, this uh, sector com come true. If you go to the next slide, this is a quick overview of the, the worldwide resource. So um, 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 I will say to the 7% of the audience that voted for Tidal Energy, thank you very much, but it's true, we're not the the highest potential. 
actually the the resource for tidal energy is is very different from from wave and from wind it's not spread along the coastline as as wind and wave uh, it's more uh, narrow to uh, to to some to some sites um, because the the tidal currents are located in 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 straits between islands near capes and so it makes the resource quite uh, quite narrow as i said before but still the resource is about 100 gigawatt worldwide which is uh, which is really important and uh, in europe it's uh, it's about 10 to 15 percent of this resource mainly concentrated between france and between the uk So just to give you an update on, on what's going on during this, this project on the UK side to start. So we've got O2, uh, which is the biggest device uh, in the market being built by Orbital Marine Power. It's a two megawatt device that should be deployed in the, in the Solent uh, in 2024. Uh, we've got another uh, device called Subhub developed by a company called QUD Naval, uh, which is uh, doing some trials in the area. And in another, in another site in, in Wales, we have another project where the objective is to refurbish the turbine actually in the water to a bigger turbine and the commissioning is forecasted for 2022. And now on the French side, thank you. Uh, several projects ongoing also. On Pampolbre at this site, we're just about to finish a testing campaign from the turbine HydroQuest. Um, the, the, the machine should be retrieved by, by the end of this summer. And we're preparing a second, uh, second deployment of another company, uh, which is Minesto, that has a a different type of, uh, of device, as you can see, um, tidal turbines can be quite different. We have a different range of technology and the one developed by Minesto is more like a kite style and should be in the water in Pampo around 2020, summer 2022. In Ravlanchar area, um, as, as I said before, it's, it's one of the biggest area uh, in terms of tidal energy potential. We've, we've got there two pilot farms being developed with uh, commissioning in 2022, 2023. Uh, first area is developed by CMEC Atlantis Energy, very well-known uh, UK tidal, tidal manufacturer. And the second one is uh, handled by HydroQuest. So after its trial in Pample, they will install seven devices in, in Ramlanchar. And the last project on the slide is developed by a company, French company Sabella in Bretagne. Uh, they partner with um, a, a local utility company to develop a project in different phase in the Morbihan Gulf. So they will develop two turbines in the next few months and, and, uh, and further extension are forecasted for 23 and, and, and the next years. So that was a very short overview of projects being developed at the moment. There are others, especially in the north of the UK and in, and in Scotland, um, but, but these one are quite representative from, from the sector in, in, in Europe. So I think my key messages today are the one you can, you can read on, on the slide. Um, we, we're really close to commercial and uh, we're looking for also uh, funding opportunities through feed-in tariff or contracts for difference, just as other renewable energy projects. If you're interested in the sector, I, I strongly encourage you to sign up to our newsletter where there is really much information on the sector, uh, on, on the challenge we're facing and on the, on the different developments that are planned in, in the next few months. So thank you very much for your attention and, and see you, of course, at, at Synergy in September. Thank you, Malin, for, for um, this very useful presentation. And uh, as you also heard, uh, capital is dramatically 
needed. Um, and that brings me as well to, to one of the comments, and thank you so much for commenting on the results of the, of the poll earlier. Um, there is also this, this interesting um, figure, 7% uh, of the audience actually think that the lack of dialogue with local authorities and territories is a, is a hindrance to, to the development of, of marine renewable energy. Uh, how, how do you think um, we could bring together the, the private and public sector and, and could all, all the pilot tests be used for, for that purpose? Do you have any recommendation on this? I, I, I have to say that the collaboration does exist already and is very close. Um, the, in particular, the French region that I know much more than, than on the UK side, noting the development of the sector. Uh, they've understood uh, long ago the benefit of the sector for uh, the dynamism of, of the region and, and, and their company and the local supply chain. So it, it's, it's maybe less on their side than on the government side where we need to convince uh, that those projects are important for the future and they can uh, be competitive to uh, other renewable energy projects rather than at the regional side where again, social acceptance for these projects is really high. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Um, and for those of you who are interested in learning more about uh, innovation, we've been discussing with several maritime and energy clusters across Europe, and uh, we wrote a short blog with some of this innovation. Uh, and we would like to um, thank WeMAC, uh, Synergy, Solution & Co for sharing of this disruptive uh, innovation. Uh, a link will uh, be shared uh, in the feed. Uh, we'll be also uh, sending a short um, note to all of you along with the presentation. Uh, we're seeing just a, a question here in the chat. So this information will be, will be available to you uh, after the webinar. Uh, and now we'll take a few questions uh, from the audience. Uh, so we have a few, just checking with, uh, with the team. All right. Um, So one of the questions that was asked earlier, uh, and it's, it's a question uh, for uh, Marlene, uh, why France didn't put tidal energy in its programmation, programmation pluriannuelle de l'énergie? Um, do you think there will be uh, some insights uh, available uh, for the next PPE? And what are the financial solutions to develop um, this type of products in, uh, in France? Uh, why? That's a good question. Uh, the, the, that was not what uh, we wanted, of course. Uh, the, the, the main reason uh, was that they were not convinced by the maturity of the sector. I think this is changing very much just right now with the in particular, these three pilot forms and even four pilot forms with the, the four project uh, that I'm told about earlier in the, in the session. Um, there is a review of this uh, PPE in French, so programming for renewable energy in the future, uh, just uh, going on right now. And we are uh, working very hard to get tender in this uh, next uh, programmation in order to have a normal path for development for, for the future. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Uh, we hope, Fanny, that answers your question. Uh, if uh, you have uh, any other uh, specific question, we could also connect you with, uh, with Marilyn, if that's of any use. Uh, do we have any other question? I know we're running a little bit late. Uh, is there any other question that we would like to to answer um, 
Any other questions for the panelists? Okay, um, so just a few announcements before we close this uh, webinar. So we remind you that this uh, webinar was a um, short introduction to the uh, national forum organized by SE on June 22nd. Um, so don't, we will be sharing the presentation. Uh, if you have any uh, further question, don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, we also would like to um, remind you we have a call for climate solution running with a winning prize for an, exhibi an exhibition uh, uh, booth uh, for the World Impact Summit. That is a physical event for the B2B sector uh, across many different industries. We're actually looking for concrete uh, answers to your CSR challenges. So if you uh, would like to participate, we'll share a link as well with you and it will be also available in the uh, email that you will receive after this, uh, this uh, event. Uh, and finally, uh, you'll find in the chat a small feedback survey. Uh, if you have a few minutes, feel free to fill it in. That will really support us to improve upcoming initiative that we're running until the large scale event uh, that will held in Bordeaux, France on uh, December 2nd and 3rd. So thank you all for your time today. We very much appreciate it. We hope that was very useful and you found very useful insight to the development of your products, but also maybe some of the market opportunities that you discovered. Uh, and again, if you have any feedback or questions, uh, feel free to, to contact us and uh, we look forward to welcoming you to another webinar or the event on December 2nd and 3rd. Thank you so much and uh, have a, a lovely day ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. My best. Bye -bye. Thank Thanks you. a lot.